Thanks for being here, and thanks to the organizers for putting this on and, and including Avita on the agenda. Um, we have some forward-looking statements, and uh, my crystal ball is broken, so I'm, I don't have a clear vision on the future exactly. Avita Medical is a device company. We're focusing on commercialization of products aimed at treatment of a range of skin, order, uh, skin disorders, uh, skin injuries, and defects. We are publicly traded on the Australian Stock Exchange, also listed on the OTCQX. These products are cleared for marketing in the European Union, Australia, and China, and we're working toward our uh, PMA in the U.S. for an indication for thermal burn injuries. We're also working under a contract with BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, which is a group within HHS responsible for um, our nation's preparedness for mass casualty events. The resale product for burn injuries has been identified uh, within a portfolio of products for BARDA, not just for um, um, as a uh, use as a medical countermeasure in a mass casualty scenario, but also with the potential for elevating the standard of care for uh, burn care in the U.S. and um, providing associated health economic benefits. Our core technology is an autologous cell harvesting device. The device allows a clinician to take a small sample of the patient's skin and process it using first uh, proprietary enzyme and secondly some uh, mechanical disaggregation to produce a, a suspension of cells. We call the suspension of cells regenerative epithelial suspension. The regenerative epithelial suspension created can be used on an area 80 times the size of the donor skin that was used to create it. I want to talk you through a little, uh, some of the key highlights uh, concerning the mechanism of action. This illustration depicts the difference between the, the resource constrained environment uh, in the top half of the image showing the, the um, reliance um, of wound healing normally on limited cells coming in from the edges of the wound and from dermal appendages. Whereas with the introduction of regenerative epithelial suspension, uh, we overcome those resource limitations. We think about uh, a few key features of regenerative epithelial suspension. Firstly, that it's complete, uh, and that is reference to the fact that all skin cell types are included in the cell suspension. It is available in that this device is used at the point of care for the patient. There are no laboratory facilities required. Nothing is sent out for processing and, and later returned to the patient. The, um, the regenerative epithelial suspension, or RES, is autologous, which has uh, excellent implications in terms of safety for the, the patients. And uh, in particular, I want to talk about activation and, and, and how we know these cells are activated and what that means. We have an ongoing collaboration with the Institute for Skin Integrity at Huddersfield University in the UK. Uh, this work is, is recently being completed and we're working on uh, getting it published, but I, I wanted to show some quick highlights. It's important to see in the, uh, across this first series of uh, images the, um, that the, the scientists were able to identify the, phen uh, the phenotypic changes associated with the loss of contact inhibition. So when you have an injury, cells at the edge of the injury lose contact inhibition, and that is the, the trigger that initiates the healing cascade. But we want to overcome that uh, resource constraint of just healing from the edge, and we can do that with this uh, suspension applied over the entire surface area of the wound. We can see uh, in these images that uh, we have the morphologies of cells associated with them being in the proliferative and migratory state versus in their normal everyday state of, of, of being a barrier function in skin. We also know that these cells know that they're activated and in a healing ready mode uh, by looking at uh, some important signals, and this is just an example in the, in the bottom left. Uh, involucrin and, and PERK are important signals in this cascade. Involucrin is, is 
present in normal intact skin, and then when cells are in that proliferative state, the this, this involucrin goes away. And PERK displays the reverse characteristic. It is increased um, and, uh, during cell proliferation. So this is just an example of uh, uh, some results showing that, that uh, a comparison between res and intact skin in terms of those signaling factors. While the viable cells that we introduce in res are important, the non-viable cells also play a role. The, the damaged and necrotic cells release uh, HMGB1, high motility group box 1, as well as heat shock protein. And these signals are key to both initiating and sustaining this, um, this healing cascade, this response associated with proliferation and migration. And, and lastly, uh, secreted factors uh, are present in our uh, laboratory-based wound healing model after treatment of that wound with res at precisely the times uh, that we would expect to see them based on uh, the published literature on the wound healing cascade. So I mentioned earlier that we have uh, a number of product approvals. Uh, this is a this is success uh, to to get all these regulatory approvals in place and in process, uh, but it's not enough for uh, to to really um, realize the commercial potential. We need to build a robust clinical data package across the range of indications we're interested in, so that we can have the appropriate conversations with clinicians, and even beyond that, to understand the health economic benefits as well. So in the U.S., we have uh, an ongoing pivotal trial. Uh, FDA has just granted us continued access so that we can continue to allow the uh, surgeons participating in that trial to access the product while the PMA is uh, under preparation and review. But we expect the, the full clinical package to come together during the first quarter of 2017 for that PMA. The results of our venous leg ulcer pilot study uh, have been presented earlier this year and also are in preparation for publication. We had, uh, in 2015, a diabetic foot ulcer publication in the British Journal of Surgery. Uh, and for our repigmentation application, we had some nice results come out in the Journal of American Academy of Dermatology for patients with segmental vitiligo and piebaldism. And also this year, uh, recently, we had uh, randomized control trial results showing the positive impact of Renovacel for the treatment of hypopigmentation in burn scars. So I want to take you through a couple of uh, clinical cases. This one is uh, this one was in the U.S. under our compassionate use investigational device exemption. This patient has suffered a massive burn injury, and the issue in this case is that there is insufficient donor skin available to cover the patient's injuries. But with the combination of meshed autograft, meshed more widely than would be done conventionally, in conjunction with uh, topical application of the regenerative epithelial suspension, we can achieve closure in these patients. And reducing the amount of skin means that we can reduce the number of procedures. In this particular case, the patient would probably have had a hospital stay based on their uh, severity matched uh, historical control of 120 days. This patient walked out of the burn unit in under 40 days. An, an ex another example, slightly different in terms of the, the modality of use, this patient has a deep partial thickness injury, so they have intact dermis, uh, but this patient's face was not healing uh, after the, the, the boiler exp explosion that they experienced. The area was debrided and treated with regenerative epithelial suspension. And not only did we achieve wound closure, but going back to what I was saying earlier about how all of the, the cell types are present in the, in the res, that includes melanocytes, which are the pigment-producing cells, allowing for restoration of normal pigmentation. So this reduction in the requirement for autografting or averting autografting altogether uh, you certainly don't want to put autographs on, a, on the face of a patient, has implications f in the mass casualty scenario uh, in terms of alleviating one of the bottlenecks. So we're working uh, with the uh, BARDA to establish resell as the go-to autograph sparing technique. 
um, th part of what helps us do that is the fact that this device is, can go anywhere, can be used anywhere, and, and is um, entirely self-contained, used at the point of care. This contract that we have with BARDA has a number of different aspects to it. One is the establishment of a national strategic stockpile for emergency use in the event of a mass casualty involving thermal burn injuries. But uh, the agency, the authority, takes a, a holistic view on what it means to be a nation prepared. So we are working also to um, in, engender familiarity and acceptance within the U.S. burn centers uh, and also um, to um, work on understanding the health economic impact, the budget impact, both from the hospital and the payer perspectives, so that we have, um, in the event of an emergency, something available for use that has already been accepted by the clinicians who we need to have using it. We, uh, we did complete enrollment in our pivotal trial uh, in January, and our last subject follow-up will come 52 weeks later. Uh, it'll take us a few months to, to, to get the clinical study report finalized and submitted for our PMA. PMA approval we anticipate sometime around nine months later. Just uh, t touch on some of the other indications. Uh, here are a couple of cases of uh, the treatment of venous leg ulcers using the product Regenercell. This was in the UK. These patients are often homebound and waiting for a home health care provider to come and do dressing changes. They also experience a lot of pain, and they just have limited uh, sort of ability to participate in day-to-day -day life. And what we have seen anecdotally is that um, pain and the level of exudate, the level of fluid coming out of these wounds, which is what requires all those dressing changes, reduces quite quickly within uh, the first five days after treatment with this suspension. So this inspired us to do uh, a pilot randomized control trial. We wanted to, to work quickly through this. We had a limited time frame for follow-up, but we looked at large wounds. So we, we're not focusing on the incidence of wound closure because some of these wounds are up to 80 square centimeters, and that's not going to heal under any circumstances really within uh, the time frame of 14 weeks, which was the follow-up for our study. However, we showed statistically significant improvements in the Regenercell group versus the control group for changes over time in wound size, in pain, and on some of our health-related quality of life metrics. We used the, the Charing Cross venous leg ulcer questionnaire. So we have the sense now that th the treatment with Regenercell puts these wounds on a, a healing trajectory, and we will be working toward uh, a pivotal trial to, um, to have a supplement to our PMA application for the treatment of, of venous leg ulcers. A similar kind of wound that, that has the, um, the similarities in terms of becoming chronic and, and being challenging to heal is a uh, pretibial laceration. And I wanted to show a quick example on that. This is a, a, a terrible and painful wound that is difficult to heal, happens often in the over 60 population. And this particular example um, showed tremendous progress during just three weeks after Renova cell treatment. I showed this slide last year. Uh, the, the repigmentation result is excellent. What we've gone on to do with, in our collaboration with the Netherlands Institute for Pigment Disorders is look at different kinds of laser preparation. So here, rather than treating a wound for the purposes of healing it, we actually do some laser ablation so that we can provide access to um, introduce new melanocytes from res so that the, the pigmentation can be restored. A uh, segmental vitiligo patient has no melanocytes, so this is a, a definitive um, uh, demonstration of melanocyte transfer. We went further uh, on in the research to identify what laser settings could be used that would be less invasive so that the procedure could be more comfortable for the patient. Uh, that work has been completed and we're, we're getting that submitted for publication as we speak. And we're beginning a new uh, body of work with this group to look at the non-segmental population uh, for vitiligo, which represents about 80% of the cases of vitiligo worldwide. 
This slide is here just to um, illustrate that we're really not limited by uh, the market opportunity. We're really just going to be limited by the, the feet that we can put on the street and uh, our ability to communicate and get word out on this. Uh, tremendous opportunities across the geographies that we're working in and across the indications that we're playing in. So the task before us really at this point is to translate uh, all of what we've done in clinical development to successful commercialization. As I mentioned, our burn trial is complete. Uh, FDA has granted the resell device expedited access pathway designation. Uh, so we're working in a more interactive fashion with the agency to get through the PMA process. We have randomized control trials now either completed or uh, in preparation for publication. We spent a lot of time and, and resources this year really further developing our understanding of the mechanism of action and uh, we'll continue to move forward with generating uh, additional and compelling data for some of these larger marketing uh, market opportunities. So um, with, with this evidence uh, coming into force and our health economic modeling coming up behind it, we're looking to um, make sure that we um, deliver to the market through an effective sales organization, uh, either by building one ourselves or with, um, with partnerships. Thanks so much.